Welcome to the wide world of esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Knorr. Today, my guest is Jason McIntosh of GG Circuit. Our topic is esports venues. We have a problem. Welcome, Jason. Thank you, Catherine. It's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. So what is GG Circuit? Well, GG Circuit has been around since 2008. Um, we started doing uh, nationwide tournaments with a gaming venues, land centers, cyber cafes, what do you want to, whatever you want to call them. And uh, they would do their local tournament on Saturday. Then we bring everybody together online in a, in a little internet chat room and we would do tournaments over the years. Now, since then, and since about 2014, we started to build software. So currently we do software services and support for over 600 locations around the world. Wow, that's incredible. Um, I bet you've learned a lot along the way. I understand that, uh, you're, uh, you're writing a book? Yeah. So, you know, I think like anybody in their careers, they, there's different divergent paths you go. I've been anything from a web developer to a teacher to a professional wrestling referee at one point. So, uh, you know, I got involved in esports in 2004 with, um, with the brick and mortar uh, locations. And we've been in every esports scenario, I think, that you can possibly uh, uh, describe and, and some that that blow our minds who we have worked with over the years. So we've, we've taken that expertise of not only providing software, but also providing consulting for these esports venues, and we're putting them into a book on how to open an esports venue. Oh, terrific. And that gets us to the venues. Now that a lot of the facilities are returning uh, to have live events. Uh, what are you doing to assist them? Well, I, you know, I, the esports world is awesome and we are behind esports 100%. But I think we, we've kind of taken a look back at our data and we have realized, and this is, I won't know if I would necessarily call it a truth bomb, but we have realized that esports by itself as a brick and mortar business is not sustainable. Mm. Um, we've looked back, you know, in, in our years since 2016 and granted different locations have come along across the years, but we have um, serviced over a thousand locations since 2016 with our software. And only about 40% are continuing. So 60% of those thousand are failing. And so, what we're trying to do is offer up different ways for a business to succeed with esports. I think there's too much emphasis on casual gaming and competitive gaming as a business, and that's it. When I think esports needs to be a piece of the overall business puzzle, uh, where you're providing food and beverage, maybe you're providing um, other, e other attractions in conjunction with esports to make money, um, doing things like birthday parties, doing things like summer camps, need to be a part of the whole picture for uh, venues to succeed more in the esports space. You know, that really makes sense because if you look at other industries like restaurants, they're going to make a lot of their profit from alcoholic beverages. Mm -hmm. If you look at a movie theater, they're going to make profits from soft drinks. Um, you know, I can see where uh, there needs to be kind of some refinement of this process. Yeah. And, you know, so um, I know that you mentioned in a, a, a email to me, you asked a question. Um, why do you do you feel like esports is a dirty word? Okay, <laughs> I don't know what your answer to that is. Sure, so I'm sure. <laughs> well, when people come to us, and we again, we service all kinds of people, we service universities, casinos, businesses, and the, the traditional land centers, as just to name a few. And I think the problem is that esports is such a hot buzzword that it gets thrown in with a lot of different things. It's kind of like if you are a programmer in IT 
and your parents, when you come home, they expect you to fix your printer just because you know you're in IT. Uh, I, because esports, when people come and ask us and say, well, how do I do esports? You don't really do esports, you just do modern gaming with PCs and consoles. But esports is part of the vernacular now. And when people say esports, we hope that they understand the whole picture. But a lot of times they just focus on the competitive aspect. And when you're talking about the entire landscape of gamers, com com competition only stands for like 10 to 20% of the entire picture. And there's, there's too much focus on competition. And when you do competition, you have a lot more losers than you do winners. And I think that that does not bode well for people to come back to your space when all they remember is being wiped off a Call of Duty map in the first round of a tournament. Um, <clears throat> I think we really need to look beyond competition and serve the whole picture of gaming, again, for venues to succeed. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. And tell me, what has been your journey to this space? Yeah, so um, <laughs> when we started in 2004, and again, we are one of the few locations that have survived as long as we have, 16 years now. Um, our entry into esports was uh, our founder, Zach Johnson, was a youth minister. And he used to uh, <clears throat> be part of youth group, and they started bringing in their Xboxes to the youth group. They started doing land parties. And pretty much a 10 person youth group and it started being 70 every Sunday. So he's an entrepreneur. He's done internet service providers and a few other things. And so that's where his entry into esports came to build a business, a brick and mortar land center, uh, snacks and drinks, tournaments, and, and all kinds of different things. As we have grown, you know, we've tried to do other um, locations. And I think for, for a successful business owner with one location, it's hard to clone yourself sometimes to do other locations. We've never had another location that's been as successful as the one that's in his hometown. And so going beyond that, you know, we, we used uh, some management software for 10 years. And I won't name the competitor, but at the end of the day, we felt like we could do more and better things to engage the players through software, as well as provide quality management software, as well as provide uh, what we would call diskless boot uh, software, um, just to make a venue more efficient. Um, and so we went from, and we still do the land center to this day, but we went more from the land center experience to providing software and now that we've been doing this for 16 years, we also have a dedicated team that's been involved in this for 10 years that does everything from startup consulting to being on site and implementing it and um, daily updates of, of people's software so that they don't have to worry about it. Um, <clears throat> you know, it takes a very special individual with a lot of skills to run one of these locations. And oftentimes it's a skeleton crew of, of a main owner and, and a handful of minimum wage employees. And so when you've got to be, you know, the accountant, the marketer, the web designer, the technologist, the, uh, the host, and everything in between, I think that's why a lot of these folks fail because it, it's unforgiving, I think, for a, for a long period of time to be able to keep one of these going uh, when and sometimes it's just you and it's hard to find somebody as dedicated as you. Have you seen like um esports venues franchise in uh yet and uh what what would make for a successful franchise yeah that's a good question i think a lot of the things that i'm already saying in regards to you know adding in food and beverage maybe making it a bar scenario um just these different things that i'm saying about not making it an esports but place but making it so that you cater to a wider band of demographic versus just competitors. Um, just to name a few, there are there is Contender Esports that's out there. There's Nerd Street Gaming that are doing um, locations. There's Vindex now with the Belong model. Um, I feel like there is, that there is Play Live Nation under the Simplicity umbrella. Um, all four of those are doing franchising. 
but I think it's too early in these franchise models for us to be able to pull numbers like we have in our in our overall history to know whether or not those are succeeding. Sure. Okay, so let's look at the prosperity part of this. Mm -hmm. What what are the keys and how can GG Circuit help make that happen? Yeah, absolutely. So again, we've uh, we're we're big believers in being transparent and we're big believers in evaluating what we have done and what works. So when I'm talking about catering to a wider demographic we've come up with five categories of gamers and we call these the five C's and why we have come up with this is this is for venues to get out of that uh, just catering to competition and trying to find ways to cater to everybody across the gaming landscape those five C's are the consumers so those are the casual gamers the people that are on Twitch, the people that are watching YouTube videos. It's it's community. It's those people that like to be on Discord talking to other gamers, on the Twitch chat talking to each other. And those are also the people that are going to build your gaming nights. Well, it's kind of like you know a gaming club around a specific game. Um, we have the collectors. Those are those folks that just grind away on a game because they love badges, they love achievements, they love uh, getting skins in a new game. Uh, creators, those are the, the streamers, the people that are build video content, are the influencers, are the game developers, uh, and then finally the competitors. So that's that you know small band of folks that, that want to come in for tournaments all the time. But we're hoping it's more of a, uh, you know, a for fun activity or uh, you know, just a way to come in and get a little trinket that they, you know, a trophy, a medal, something like that versus trying to provide a big prize pool or something like that that might turn somebody off. Um, so again, esports needs to be the piece of the pie, not the focus, but we need to cater to the entire landscape of gaming versus just a small percentage. So how can mainstream businesses get into esports? Yeah, so I didn't go back and do the numbers before this interview, but we just reached our 100th university that that uses our platform. So we've got a lot of data around universities and, and why they're getting into esports. There's various reasons. Um, you know, there's scholarships now, there's esports teams. Um, there's a few models out there that are charging students or they're opening it up to the public to get people in um, and, and that's working. But I think more and more they're offering it up free as a way to get ROI from tuition. Um, so what we're trying to do from a mainstream business perspective is we're offering up uh, two packages. Uh, number one, we are going out and we're sourcing the PCs, the desks, the chairs, the server hardware, the software set up, we're sending our team to go and set it up and providing daily maintenance. And we've done the numbers there and it takes about 25% to 30% of daily work off of a manager's plate. And that's a, that's a huge boon for them because they can, a lot of these folks are business visionaries or you know they love the business part more than they love the technology. So if they can get that off of their plate, um, you know, that's a huge way for them to focus on marketing, advertising, getting people in the door versus a fortnight patch dropped in the middle of Thursday. And I got to focus all my attention on getting all my PCs up to date. Um, <clears throat> so we're providing that as a way to I mean, it's also a ramp up like it takes six to eight months to get comfortable with this type of business. So for us to have 16 years of experience and drop that time factor of getting ramped up and being able to have someone to answer your questions immediately. I think that's another huge positive for these folks. The other thing that we're doing, and this is inside baseball, Catherine, you're getting the scoop here, <laughs> is uh, November 15th, we are announcing a, what we're calling an arcade esports attraction. And so this is going to be a lot like a Papa shot or a ski ball that can be dropped into 500 square feet in a bowling alley or a movie theater or a co-working space, you name it. And we are 
piloting this in multiple locations right now where it will be self-service. The only thing you have to do is monitor that the hardware doesn't walk away. It will be an hourly competition just based on, on game participation. There will be um, lighting and visual guides for uh, on the tables, pointing out the player who has won. Um, and they'll be able to redeem that for digital gift cards for popular brands up to about 75 brands. And basically we want to change the model from focusing on competitors to just those kids that wanna come in and do a quick play by, while mom is shopping. And so it's, it's a brand new, I would call it a paradigm shift in the way that venues are looked at just to have a fun way to participate and be rewarded just for playing about an hour. Oh, that sounds terrific and exciting. Well, you know, everyone in businesses, their experience has been pre-pandemic. And then now we recently have people who have experience with pandemic business. Mm -hmm. What do you, what will be the differences that you foresee post pandemic, if any? Well, I, what I see, especially in the esports um, venue space, is that there are a lot more companies coming to us than mom and pop independent locations. Um, I think there is going to be a, a large amount of big brands, you know, I don't want to specifically say, but family entertainment chains, electronic stores, um, telecom giants that are wanting to put esports in, in this small footprint of what we're talking about here, just as an added attraction to their overall revenue generating business. Um, from a part pandemic standpoint, we survived. I mean, it, it, you know, a lot of people didn't. And obviously, we're providing software for entertain, entertainment based locations. So movie theaters were hit hard. We were hit hard. What we did was we did a quick pivot to do an at home version of our software. Um, in that you know, you had to download a client, but it was a way for our locations to still to stay connected with um, their gamers. But what we found out was these gamers are coming to their locations because they don't have a high end in, in setup. And although we did get decent participation in our at home client, um, we were surprised at, at, at the lower numbers. So I think if you're in a pandemic and in a situation where you can't get out, it's very hard to convert gamers to download a client and install something that, you know, tracks stats or whatever. And so it will be very interesting because some of our locations are still having to uh, social distance. You know, they can't have a PC up against another PC in their, in their square footage. Uh, so maybe their PC usage is half of what it, could be, um, but with the, the companies being able to bankroll this with social distancing and hopefully more people being vaccinated and social distancing uh, waning a little bit, we'll see with any new variants, it's still a risk, but I can tell you we're seeing about 20 to 30 demos a week of our software, and so there's no lack of people wanting to get in this business and try their hand at uh, having esports in a physical location with people being um, next to each other playing. And, you know, you can say what you want about people wanting to be in their rooms playing online with their headsets, but it's just like, why would I drink a beer at home when I can go to the bar with my friends and hang out? Esports and gaming, it's the same thing. Like I can play with my friends, but there's nothing quite like the substitution of being able to punch a friend in the arm because he did something stupid during your, you know, your match and you're sitting right next to him, as well as teams that want to um, develop and practice together, learn, you know, body language and, and subtle cues. And there's no, no, no substitute for that. Sure. And um, so we have some um, images and I'd like to kind of go through them and have you tell us about these particular venues because it's we've been talking about venues but it's kind of fun to see what they look like yeah so sure. 
so we'll start with the blue one. Um, <laughs> I can't remember what it what it is. Yeah, so I think it's Bendix Arena. Bendix Arena is a brand new, <clears throat> well, the, it used to be the uh, College Football Hall of Fame in South Bend, Indiana, that uh, uh, is the home of Notre Dame football. And that closed down probably about five years ago. And so the city of South Bend took it upon themselves to embrace esports. So um, they hired our team to come out and, and set up everything from soup to nuts. And um, they have two facilities. One is a land center like you see in this picture. And the other, they have a, an actual um, uh, auditorium where they're going to do a lot of, of larger scale tournaments that will bring in a, a crowd. Um, so it's a very interesting setup. And the city of South Bend is one of the, the cities that we have supported. Um, one of the few that we have supported that's been like the, you know, the, <clears throat> the board of the city has passed this as a way to um, uh, embrace gaming and esports uh, for the future. Sure, Bethel Co yeah, Bethel College also plays there. Oh, as okay. Their, their practice facility. All right, let's look at the high school one, the, I guess, CBC High School. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is uh, Christian Brothers College High School in St. Louis, Missouri. And we installed them, I think, February of 2020, so right before the shutdown. And they are a private school. Um, they did a, a survey of their students or potential students, junior high students, and 70% of them came back and said if esports was offered at the high school, they would want to come to CBC. Um, so they are using it as a casual space, but mainly for their esports teams. And at the time we installed this, this was the largest high school esports installation in the country. Wow. Okay, let's look at Bendix, I believe. Yeah, we just did we just did that one. Oh, oh, we did okay. What the next one then? Uh Helix? Yeah, Helix Esports. So I, I did failed to mention, and I'm they'll kill me for this, but in June we were acquired by a um publicly listed company called Esports Entertainment Group. Um Helix was a partner of ours before we were acquired, and uh, Esports Entertainment Group acquired us along with Helix Esports. So Helix has three main locations right now on the East Coast. One's in North Bergen, New Jersey, just over the bridge in New York. Another one is in Patriot Place uh, outside of Gillette Stadium in Boston. And um, the third, they're going to be opening up at UCLA's campus. Um, and they have two of the largest uh, location uh, for an esports venue, both with 100 PCs, as well as a bar, as well as uh, restaurant offerings. Oh, wow, that's terrific. And then the next one, maybe one we haven't looked at. <laughs> yeah, so this was uh, Gen Con, I believe 2017. Um, for five years, we were the esports room at Gen Con. And this was the last year we did it. And we saw 10,000 people in four days. We had 250 stations for people to play games at. We garnered about 50 grand in revenue in those four days, as well as we ran 5,000 events. Now, a lot of these weren't your bracketed tournaments. They were, you know, impromptu tournaments like we were talking about. There were a lot of random we'll grab five random people here and five random people here and put them in a league of legends match together. And we gave out trophies and, and medals. And it seemed like every year, the same people would come want to come back because they wanted to get that year's model of medals and trophies and, and competitions. And so that's what we've catered this um, esports attraction that I'm talking about after is our experience at Gen Con. Okay. So we've talked about, challenges with esports and uh, the venues but do you are you optimistic about esports or do you feel pessimistic about the business at this point I, I feel i feel absolutely optimistic even though i just want to call out the issue of those thinking that hey i'll just set up a bunch of pcs and i'm going to make a bunch of money 
And, and I want, I just want to warn businesses that they need to think beyond just gaming when they're thinking about a business because it's been proven not to work. I think that one day we hopefully will be there where people can just, you know, do computers and have tournaments all the time and esports can be sustainable, but it's not ready yet. So until it is ready, they need to do more things to uh, bring in revenue outside of just gaming. I have no doubt in my mind that esports is going to be the next big thing because of the companies that are coming to us, the universities that are coming to us. We're now getting into the casino space. And there's a lot of opportunity for those businesses that haven't yet tapped into esports. Um, but I just want more people to know that. that a, we exist, we can help them ramp up and get their doors open faster. Um, B, esports by itself is not going to work. You got to do, do, do something else. And then, and then three, you know, don't just look at the end of your nose and think that that's it. Make sure to make connections in this industry with other land centers, with other gamers, be open to communities coming into your space. Um, don't try to be elitist just because it says esports on the door, because a lot of times players will get turned off because it says esports because it think, they think it's only competition. Um, make sure to open yourself up to the video game demographic. You know, that's really wise advice. And let's look at how um, people can find you. Let's look at your website. And um, I think that that's a wealth of information. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know um, like when this will be out, but ggcircuit.com is the website where it's kind of the, the launching point of all of our stuff related to our software and our consulting services. Um, we will be doing a university-based webinar on November 9th. Uh, for a group called ACUI, which is the uh, College Union Association. Um, we will be, you know, I was talking about the esports attraction. We will be at IAPA, I-A-A-P-A, -A -A which is the um, amusement uh, convention in, in Orlando. It's an awesome place. People have like video games, virtual reality, axe throwing. They even have like roller coasters in there. Um, that's where we will be uh announcing our esports attraction. And then as you mentioned at the beginning of the video, there's a website that we have out there called thatesportsbook.com. And we will be uh, shipping out books December 1st, uh, once we finalize the book and get them out all printed. But it's all about how to start an esports venue and taking our 16 years of experience, putting it into a book and hoping that it helps someone along the way. Fantastic. Well, Jason, you've provided a lot of great information to us today, and I hope people will look for a GG circuit and get uh, find your expertise from your book and in person. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine, for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thank you. And thank you to our viewers for joining us today. Next week, my guest will be Steffi Bao of Init Esports. See you then.